Imagine dropping below the waves and feeling the weight of a world pressing down on you. Not metaphorically, literally. Every 10 meters you fall, the water above you adds roughly one extra atmosphere of pressure. At a few hundred meters, that pressure is enormous. At a few thousand, it is a planet. Now ask yourself, what would that pressure do to a human body? Would we be crushed like a soda can? Or could we change, reshape, and become something new? That's the question we're answering today. We'll map the physiology, the biochemistry, and the wild possibilities of human bodies adapted to the abyss. From air-filled lungs that collapse, to blood that behaves like oil, and membranes that refuse to shatter. The deep sea is not only hostile, it's a force that forges life into unfamiliar forms. People assume the ocean is just cold and dark. But pressure is a physical force that changes chemistry. It rewrites how cells behave. So you're saying deep sea pressure doesn't only squish you, it changes the rules biology uses? Exactly. Think of pressure as an invisible sculptor. It nudges molecules, bends membranes, and forces evolution to invent new chemistries. Air spaces are the first casualties. Lungs, sinuses, and the physics of breath. The most obvious problem is air. Humans evolved with air-filled lungs, and air hates pressure. It compresses. At depth, the balloon of your lungs becomes smaller, and the relative pressures crush delicate tissue unless compensated. That's why divers use pressurized habitats, and why deep submersible pilots are sealed in pressure-protected cabins. Biologically, the lung is the weak link. If we imagine true abyssal adaptation, the body might remove or radically rework air-filled organs. Possibilities include reduced or absent lung air spaces, respiration driven by dissolved oxygen in specially adapted blood, not gas exchange across alveoli, collapse-resistant airway structures with cartilage and fibrous reinforcement, alternative respiration, Think gill-like interfaces or cutaneous oxygen uptake supported by massively engineered capillary beds. We already see nature's workaround in whales. Their lungs collapse harmlessly on deep dives, but that's temporary. A true abyssal human would need permanent solutions. So the first design change is either hide the air or learn to live without it. The skeleton and muscles, flexible, not fragile. Pressure rearranges mechanical loads. On land, Gravity presses downward and builds dense, rigid bones to resist collapse. In the deep sea, however, the external pressure is omnidirectional. It squeezes from all sides. Under constant, equal pressure, rigid shells and dense bones are liabilities. What would be favored? More flexible, cartilaginous skeletons that can deform without fracturing. Think of how deep sea fishes and some squid have soft, compressible tissues rather than rigid skeletons. Hydrostatic support, tissues supported by fluid pressure gradients rather than bone. Internal organs bathed in near-isotonic fluids would be less prone to crushing. Different mineral use, bones that incorporate flexible matrix proteins and lower-density mineral faces so they bend instead of snap. If you replace a rigid frame with a flexible one, you avoid catastrophic fracture. The body becomes squeezable, but functionally intact. So your arm wouldn't break so much as flex into a different shape under pressure. Blood and circulation, from air-loaded to pressure-optimized, blood is a complex fluid, cells floating in plasma, carrying oxygen, hormones, immune cells. Under severe pressure, several problems arise. Gas bubbles create decompression hazards on ascent. Avoiding them requires eliminating gas phase transport. Viscosity changes occur as pressure alters how molecules pack together. Oxygen delivery must work without reliance on gas-filled alveoli a hypothetical abyssal human might evolve or be engineered to have. High capacity, pressure-stable oxygen carriers, modified hemoglobins or entirely different iron or copper-based proteins that bind oxygen even when gas exchange is impossible. Blood chemistry that resists pressure damage, possibly with increased intracellular solutes to keep cells from shrinking, and membranes tweaked to maintain fluidity. Microcirculation redesigned, extremely dense capillary networks near skin or gill-like structures for direct diffusion. Nature gives us hints. Some deep animals use osmolites and special proteins to stabilize oxygen carriers under pressure. We would need blood that behaves like a hydraulic fluid, stable at depth, forgiving on return to the surface. Membrane chemistry, the cellular armor of pressure. At the molecular level, pressure acts like heat in reverse. It forces molecules closer, folding proteins differently, and stiffening lipid bilayers. To resist, deep-sea organisms do two clever things. 1. Change lipid composition. Membranes have more unsaturated fatty acids to maintain fluidity under pressure. 2. 
accumulate piezolites, small molecules like TMAO in deep sea fish that stabilize proteins and prevent pressure-induced denaturation. An abyssal human would need membranes and intracellular chemistry rewired. Membrane lipids with precise unsaturation patterns, so membranes remain flexible at hundreds of atmospheres. Intracellular stabilizers to protect enzymes, chaperones to refold pressure-stressed proteins, and metabolic shifts that favor pressure-resistant pathways. This is where biochemistry becomes engineering. Tweak the membranes, add stabilizers, and your enzymes keep doing their work. So we're essentially editing the oil in the engine so it still flows in a hydraulic press. Nervous system and cognition under pressure. Your nervous system relies on electrical signals transmitted along ion channels embedded in membranes. Pressure changes how ion channels open and close. It alters neurotransmitter diffusion and can produce disorientation or seizures in unadapted divers. Classic high-pressure nervous effects. At extreme depths, synaptic timing would shift. Possible adaptations. Pressure-tolerant ion channels with altered gating mechanics. Redesigned neural architectures with slower, more redundant networks that resist timing disruption. Biochemical buffering to prevent neurotransmitter misfires. Imagine brain circuits that run in slow motion but reliably. You lose some agility but gain survival. A deep human might think different, but still think. Metabolism under crushing pressure, how energy would be rewritten. If pressure reshapes bones and blood, it rewrites metabolism entirely. At extreme depths, every biochemical reaction happens under compressed molecular spacing. Enzymes, the tiny machines that power metabolism, are exquisitely shaped. Pressure can warp them, slow them, or shut them down. To survive, a pressure-adapted human would need a low-waste, ultra-efficient metabolic system. Instead of fast-burning glucose cycles designed for sprinting and heat dissipation, deep-sea physiology would favor slow, steady ATP production, reduced metabolic heat, high-efficiency mitochondria tuned to work under compression, minimal energy loss through friction, heat, and reactive oxygen species. Deep-sea organisms don't rush, they sip energy. Every reaction is optimized for stability, not speed. So abyssal humans wouldn't burn calories, they'd conserve them like gold. Even digestion would change. Food intake would be infrequent, dense, and metabolically efficient. Think lipid-heavy fuels, processed slowly with minimal waste. Hunger itself might feel different, muted, delayed, and deeply regulated. Immune systems in the abyss, defense without inflammation. Pressure also reshapes the immune system. Inflammation, the swelling, heat, and immune overreaction humans rely on, is costly and dangerous in the deep sea. Excess inflammation increases pressure gradients inside tissues, raising the risk of damage. A deep adapted immune system would prioritize precision targeting over brute force response, slow but accurate pathogen detection, minimal swelling, enhanced cellular repair instead of aggressive destruction. Inflammation is like using a flamethrower indoors. At depth, that's lethal. So the immune system becomes more surgical? Exactly. White blood cells would be fewer but more specialized. Immune memory would be incredibly refined, and many surface pathogens wouldn't survive pressure anyway, meaning fewer threats, but higher stakes when infection occurs. Reproduction under pressure, the most radical shift of all. Reproduction may be the single greatest barrier to permanent human life at depth. Human reproduction relies on air-dependent physiology, narrow pressure tolerances, delicate embryonic development. At abyssal pressures, gametes, fertilization, and embryogenesis would need to be entirely redesigned. Possible adaptations include pressure-stable reproductive cells, extended gestation periods, protective womb environments with controlled internal pressure, reduced birth rates with higher offspring survival investment. Deep sea species don't reproduce often, but when they do, it's deliberate. So fewer children, but each one is incredibly valuable. Exactly. Reproduction would be slow, planned, and resource-intensive, a biological reflection of the deep sea's scarcity. Under crushing pressure, biology becomes conservative, deliberate, and precise. Nothing is wasted. Nothing is rushed. Survival becomes an art of patience. The abyss would not make us stronger in the way we imagine, but it would make us different, reshaping what it means to be human. If this journey into extreme human adaptation bent your understanding of biology, you're exactly where you belong. Subscribe to Science Unlocked, where we explore the edges of life, the limits of the human body, and the future science hasn't finished writing yet. Because the most alien worlds might be waiting right here on Earth.